you would please open your Bibles again to the book of John, John's gospel account. And we want to continue studying there. We're going to call this lesson in the study of John Receiving the Light. We just sang of Jesus as the bright and morning star. So many ways he's referred to as light, and truth is always represented as light. And that which is error or ignorance is that which is darkness. Now you'll remember last week, I trust, that we were looking at John who was sent from God, that is, John the forerunner of the Christ, and that notice he was a witness of the light, verse 7. Immediately, as we pointed out last week, the Scripture says he was not that light. Now, this is John writing as the Holy Spirit guides him. And of John the baptizer, he says he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And now we come down to the text that we want to look at today. And that is verses 9 through 13. Let me just read with you those verses. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, we'll read one more verse, and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That just simply goes ahead and establishes the pre-incarnate eternal word to be the Christ to tabernacle among us and since he's talking about Christ being the light then for those who accept this as the infallible inerrant all sufficient complete revelation of God that settles the matter now in this prologue introduction to this count the apostle is introducing our Lord as light I don't all the time know and I don't suppose anyone else does as to why the Holy Spirit would select certain things. Now, he chose out of John's vocabulary to write about the life of Christ, and so he begins before the world was, and he goes on down writing as we've read and studied these last couple of times we've been on this. So Jesus is introduced as the light. Well, look what we can do with that. Back up in verse 5, he said, The light that shines in the darkness... Then in verses 6 through 8, we just mentioned that, to whom John the Immerser bore witness and was the forerunner of. And now in verse 9, he's the one who gives light to every man. Now we talked about how corrupt people can get denying the truth this morning and uh, setting aside the facts of the case and going on wishful thinking and fantasies and out of touch with reality and all of that. But when you have the light of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, the truth of the New Testament to guide you, then we recognize we're kept from those things. And John declares here what becomes very evident later in his account. Not everyone, of course, because we're free moral agents, not everyone was willing to receive the light. And, of course, that's Jesus and even his own people, the Jews, who had all those years of the law of Moses, which was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.23, uh, as a whole, they rejected him. I always read things like this, and when I'm thinking about the free will or free moral agency of man, it makes me realize just how dangerous we are to ourselves. Because I can, by my own will, just reject outright what is so obvious. And that means I can reject the plain teaching of the Bible. I can understand exactly what it says. But because I am so much enamored or in love or attached to this present world in some way or the other, that I just reject what is obvious. But I notice those who did receive 
him, and we can elaborate more on that later, they're great blessings. I was thinking in the prayers that were uttered earlier and the songs we sung, when you, and liken it spiritually, when we as children of God and His great family, the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, when we do our best to adhere to the teachings of the Lord and the way we think, speak, act, how we deal with one another, how we make our choices, how we look at life, then we are pursuing God's way of living on this earth. And we're not only preparing ourselves to enter glory when we die, but we are keep, God is keeping us from getting involved in so many things that we probably couldn't handle them if we didn't pay attention to the truth of God's Word, if we didn't let it guide us, if we weren't constantly searching our minds in the light of His truth, striving to know more of the truth, understanding it more deeply, and being around people who of like precious faith of the same mind. So when you think about this, there were those who did receive Him. As I said, we'll talk more about receiving Him in a moment. But think about today. People and their ways of doing things aren't any different. So the same remains true today. Many people simply will not receive Jesus. That is, they will not pay attention to what the Bible says about Him. They're not even interested in Him. And the gospel is not much more than uh, something they've heard about. They don't. You ask the average person, give me a definition of the gospel of Christ. That might be an interesting little adventure for you to try with some people, is to ask them, what is the gospel of Christ? And what is the meaning of the word gospel? And I think we'd be surprised how some people may not know, <laughs> except to say, well, it's the gospel truth. Well, why did people ever come up with that if they don't really understand gospel truth? <laughs> that's a way of saying that's the way it is. It's the right way. And yet many people might use that and never understand why they would even use it. So why do people not believe? And why do they not obey the gospel of Christ? Why did the Jews of his day not receive him? They had all sorts of help to do it. Well, many didn't receive the light because they weren't interested in walking in the light. It's just simply that that's easy. I don't know how to put it. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Yet if you look at verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He gives light to every man. And throughout the book of John, chapter 8, verse 12, uh, 12, verse 46, he emphasizes that fact. The light is there. And we enter a dark room, you seek to turn the light on it. And we'll say things like, let's shed a little light on the subject. <laughs> well, that's the whole point. Let's have light shining that is from heaven that tells me why I'm here, where I came from, where I'm going, how am I, how am I to live here. And this is in spite of the fact that the world was made by Christ, John 1 verse 3. And yet we said all the already several times even his own people didn't receive him John 1 if you look in verse 11 he came into his own his own received him not when we think of Christ being a man of sorrows think about the fact that he knew better than anybody else that everything had been prepared in every way possible by God and he would have been instrumental in that and having everything just so that the thinking, honest-hearted man could find him. And yet so many people didn't. What did that mean to him? We think of Christ when he's nailed to the cross suffering physically, and he did. Excruciatingly so. But think about inwardly <clears throat> how he was suffering. He knew better, <clears throat> better than anybody else that nobody was without excuse. I mean, that is, no, they had no excuse. So the history of fleshly Israel is one of departure from God. Read from the beginning down to the time Christ came. And it's a history of constant departure from God by leaving the will of God for man. And that's what Jesus came into. 
If you were planning on going somewhere where you could find peace and happiness, comfort and relaxation, would you have wanted to come into this world if you had been the second person of the Godhead? Because he knew full well his end when he came here and he knew why he was coming. We can't picture him as we would our finite, human, limited being. But think about when you plan where you want to go. You don't plan to go be in misery. That's not where you say, holy, I can be more miserable over here than I can over there. Let's go here. Uh, so think about Christ. That begins to tell me what I really don't understand, the worth of a human soul. And he does all that by saying, what is a man profited to gain the whole world, lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So it helps me to understand there's something about me that God sees that I don't even understand as to my worth. That's the reason among people who have lived closely with God's Word that they've already had, they already always have had a, an estimate of humanity and the value of it different from other people. I said this morning, I think in class, that we would not like the Romans at all. What happens is we see all those ruins and we see, well, if they're, if they're, if they're amazing now, what would they have been like when they were all new and they were kept whatever? And it gives us a false concept of Rome. Because you know what we think of? We think of those people like us. And they weren't. The Romans were not like us at all. And you would not enjoy being there. You want to see how the Roman was? Just look at the cross. The men crucified him, and they're down at the foot of the cross casting lots over where they'll get his outer cloak because they were more concerned about that than what they did to him because it was woven in one seam. Doesn't bother him what's happening with that cross. Can you imagine being in, have you ever been in close proximity to somebody hurting and, and, and nearly dying from an accident? That's, I don't care if you don't know who in the world they are. That's troublesome. It gets into your insides. Bother them. We don't understand just how that light of the gospel, first in Christ himself, is the eternal word who tabernacled in the flesh, and then in the gospel message, how it overthrew such a corrupt, Society. I think I said this morning, they, the Roman had nothing for compassion. He could see you being a baby being tromped upon. It's not going to bother him. It's not going to bother him at all. Now, he might, for political purposes and for earthly gain, enter into some sort of negotiations and let somebody off in some way if it's going to serve him, and, and therefore somebody is not, uh, uh, you know, burdened in that way was not out of compassion the Roman did not prize compassion he did not prize mercy it wasn't there this was not a denominational world <laughs> who basically had biblical morals it did not have its background in it and we need to understand God says it's that mess I'm going to send my son into and he'll establish his church there and by the gospel they will be changed and that's so important. I, I don't know that I really wish I could understand the, fully the mind of the Roman because I'm afraid you have to be one of them to be able to understand it, and I don't want to be that. And all you have to see is how they treated one another and the gladiatorial games and the, all that kind of stuff. It was, um, maybe that's where the dog-eat-dog -dog world came from because that's what it was. Why did they not receive the light? Many of them didn't. Well, if you look at verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. How do you know Jesus Christ? Well, I think I have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that's designed to teach me who Christ is. And Christ said of his own people there when, they were, when it was said to him, Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. He said, have I been so long with you? 
that you don't understand that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? What do you mean? Physical looks of Christ? No. It's how he lived. We talk about the Romans and how they were. Well, you could see Christ and how he acted. And that was God in the flesh, how God would act. So when you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, look at how the Lord taught, look at how he acted, look at how he dealt with people. And you're seeing God living as a man, because he was a man. And if you look at his brothers, you remember they, they were with him. He was the first in that family. So everybody else came along later. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. John chapter 7, verse 5, and Acts 1, 14 lets us know they only believed in him after the resurrection. And by the way, that shows you the power of the resurrection in establishing in the minds of people that this is the very Messiah, the Son of God. You see it in Thomas, my Lord and my God. One thing about us that certainly remains the same is that familiarity breeds contempt. We can't believe that somebody out of the same family or my neighbor down the road or the people I went to school with, the people who came from the same background as us and ate the same turnip greens and cornbread and whatever else and beans and taters, we can't see them later on as accomplishing things that sets them up, even in this world's view, and makes them famous above other people. And we I just can't see that. And the old saying goes, you hear people say, he had never amounted to anything. <laughs> never. Mama told me many years ago now, because she's been dead a while, and it didn't surprise me, but she told me after I'd been preaching for years, the kids already up and grown. She said, you know, I didn't think you would stay with that. She said, I thought you'd try it for a while, and then you probably wouldn't stay with it. Well, that didn't surprise me. So there's things people can think, and you do it, I do it, and sometimes we're absolutely wrong, mama. <laughs> so, so there are things you do, and there's reasons you do it. We don't realize the transforming power of the gospel. I know why I have done what I have done, and what made me do what I did, and what made me make choices I made. I know it. Now, other people don't know that's going on in your mind. <laughs> Why does she want to date him? Why does he want to date her? Oh, they'd do a lot better than marry somebody else. <laughs> that may be true. But how do you know and how do you come to those conclusions? You may have adequate evidence and credible witnesses, but you also don't allow for people being rotten to the core and changing, actually repenting. That's one thing you've got to keep in mind. And evidently, his brothers repented and accepted him for who he actually was. And if you go through the book, we won't try to do it now, go through it, you'll see there are other reasons that people rejected Christ. I think one of the dangers to us is that we get, just like the Jews, some preconceived notion about how things ought to be. <laughs> and when they don't fit just like we think they ought to be, we don't accept it. And that goes all the way back, guess who? Second Kings 5 and Naaman. He had it already suited up in his mind. This is the way it's going to work. Well, who is the one really in need? Who has the incurable disease? It's Naaman. Who's made a big trip down to Israel on the basis of a little maid that was taken captive out of Israel and the report she made that there was a prophet back home to take care of your disease. Scared the king of Israel to death because the king of Syria <laughs> wrote to him and said, where's the prophet that can cure leprosy? Well, there was no cure to leprosy. And he thought, well, he's trying to find a reason to, to make war with me. People put themselves through all sorts of things because they jumped to conclusions and they act without evidence, and they assume people only do this if they're only the, this way. It didn't turn out that way at all. But then when he finally gets through all of that, and he gets down there, and the prophet sends out Gehazi, his servant, doesn't even come out seeing himself. And you know, if we'd stop and think, of course not. It wasn't the prophet healing him. It was God going to heal him. 
So he says, now come on out. Here's what the prophet said. Go dip seven times the river Jordan. Go up seven times, you'll be cleansed of your leprosy. And it made the man who was sick mad. Now think about it. Does that pretty much describe the way we are a lot of times? Of course, he was reasoned with. He went on down, dipped seven times, he was cleansed. But look what an ordeal the man went through and basically put himself through. Just simply because he didn't go down there with an attitude to speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey. There were a lot of hurdles he needed to get over. And some love darkness more than light, John 3, 19 through 20, John 5, 14 and, or 42 and 43. They, they just simply don't love the truth. It's not they can't understand it. They don't love it. If you remember when uh, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, listen to how he describes it. He's talking about a great falling away from the faith, and he's telling them when that's going to happen. And he said in verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, even while the New Testament is being written and apostles are on the earth and the miracles are here, things are already working that's going to uh, bring about the great apostasy. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Well, that means when, when the apostles are gone, when God takes those things away, then conditions will really be ripe for this thing to happen. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now watch this. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now here it is. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Who is it that sent a strong delusion? Those who don't love the truth. If you don't love the truth and you love something else, that something else can't be true. It's error, and that's how they become deluded. You don't love the truth and you run after something else because you love it, that's error you're running after, and that just blinds you further to the truth. If you turn from the truth, you can't turn to some other truth. It's not there. You just have to tr turn from the truth and turn to error or more than one error. And it says that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They enjoyed doing wrong. It's hard for us to look at a lot of these folks like we talked about this morning and even others who don't necessarily go that far in immorality and say, those folks just simply love unrighteousness. They love adultery. They love drinking. I think I'm around those kind of folks more than realize when I get around even people in the neighborhood. The word means nothing to them. They don't love it. It's not seen as, as, as showing them the way out of evil and hurt and preparing them for heaven. It's seen as stopping them from doing what they like. And, of course, some were afraid of what others thought about them. John 7, 13, chapter 9, verse 22. That's still around today, isn't it? A lot of us are very concerned about what people think about us when it comes to whether we do what we know God said or whether we don't. And if we don't, it may be because, well, I didn't want to offend somebody. Brethren, this has been in the church a long time. All my life, I've been around people who'd say, <clears throat> they didn't want me to preach on some certain thing because they were inviting somebody there and they knew what I was going to preach on and if I preached on that thing, it was going to upset them. That's been around a long time. As one lady told me, and I'd heard it as a preacher story, and never believe I would hear it as a young man, uh, she simply said, why don't you preach the gospel and leave other people alone? I, I really don't know what to say to a person like that especially when I'm about 22 years old, she's probably 70, how do you say something somebody's supposedly been a member of the church that long? Leave other people alone. Just say that to Jesus. Why don't you stay in heaven and leave us alone? Why do you shine that light of truth upon us? Of course, there were others who were just misinformed and we stopped at that as far as the facts were concerned, John 7, 40 and 43. There were others who were hardened 
because of their traditions, and they didn't want to break those traditions, John 9, 13 through 16. And this certainly is still around. People of the chief seats, they like to be praised of men, John 12, 42 through 43, and they're not going to embrace the truth. Any of those or all of them together are going to stop you from following the truth or accepting the lie. So people today do the same thing. There's, no, there's really no amazement about it. You might do well to even ask yourself sometimes, just why are you even a member of the church in the first place? Did you come to the Lord to gain remission of sins and to be a godly person and you understood the way it happened and that's why you're here? Or, or did, are you part of it because your husband or your wife or somebody or something like that appealed to you? It really wasn't obeying Christ from the heart. It was settling things among people. I don't think that can't happen. The whole denominational system is built on the idea that we find a church that suits us. What's the benefits of receiving the light? Well, he says in verse 12, the idea is to become children of God. If anybody seeks the remission of sins through the gospel of Christ by believing and obeying it, but they don't want to become a child of God, something's terribly wrong. In their thinking, it's, it's something really messed up. The word right, the right to become, means the authority to become. Receiving Christ gives us the authority and the ability to become the sons of God. That's an amazing thing that God has so set that up that way. That makes us heirs, joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 14, and 17. What a privilege it is to be born of God, John 1, 13. And it wasn't of blood, that is, of physical descent. It wasn't to do with the flesh. It wasn't to do with the will of man. But it all is according to the will of God, which will is found in His Word. A rebirth made possible by the Spirit of God working through the sword of the Spirit as we understand it and bring our life in subjection to it. John 3, 5 and Titus 3 and verse 5. Through faith in the operation of God. To receive Christ, then we must believe in His name, His authority who he is, what the Bible says about him. John 1, and you see in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even the men that believe on his name. Well, we must believe in him. <clears throat> what kind of belief is that? Just assent to the facts that he is who the Bible says he is? Well, it's certainly you won't have the kind of belief that saves you if you don't do that, but the devil's reached that far. They all assent to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God James says in the devils believe and tremble. The name of a person is often put for the person himself. John 2, 23. And that's what you've got here. Believing in him gives us power to become. Now the denominational person who thinks you're saved at the point of faith without any works of obedience doesn't see that when he reads that. He sees it faith only. Really he sees it at the devil level of faith never realizing that they do have faith. I don't think we ever think of devils or demons having faith, but they do. Think of those demons that confessed Christ while he was on the earth. They were doing more than the Jews were doing as a whole. Faith in Jesus alone, though, does not make one a child of God. Many believed in Jesus at his time, but, you know, they wouldn't confess him for fear of being put out of the synagogues, and those were priests. They didn't become disciples. Only by abiding in his doctrine did they become disciples. John 8, 30 and 32. And he made that clear. And we've quoted it this morning. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Some believe, but as I said, they wouldn't confess him. John 12, 42 through 43. And, and you see how things move along. And you get a better understanding of the faith that saves us. 
So it's a faith that obeys that saves us. That's when we become children of God. Faith makes us children of God when we put Him on in the final step in the plan of salvation. We're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Yes, we become children of God through faith, but the question must be raised, how do we come, become children of God through faith? And that's where we put Christ on in baptism. There's no other way to put him on. There's not one word in the Bible that says you can put him on any other way other than to be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. And thus Jesus is the author to all them that obey him, Hebrews 5.9. And of course one of the things is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16.16. 16. So thereby we are born again. As we're told, we must be to enter the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 5, and Titus 3, 5. Now, there's always people who misapply God's word. It becomes our responsibility to know the word right and divided that we can help people. And if you study with anybody with a denominational background that understands anything at all about whatever denominational church they're involved with, you're going to find you need to do a whole lot of unteaching and untwisting because of the way they've been taught and they think that's what God's will is. So when they say, well, receive Christ and take Him as your personal Savior, sounds good, doesn't it? But you've got to know what that man's thinking in his mind that that means. And at what point does he become my Savior? I think they would do well to remember that you can't have a closer personal walk with Jesus as Judas Iscariot did. Think about that for a minute. Think of what Judas Iscariot could tell us about what he witnessed regarding Jesus. Well, then, why did he do what he did? He had no confidence in the words of Christ and probably fit right into some of these things right here that we talked about as to why people reject the light. And there's a sinner's prayer. You can't find that in the Bible. But it doesn't seem to bother people. Have you ever noticed that? They hear denominational preachers teach that over and over again. Just stand where you are and ask Christ to come into your heart and forgive you. And they can read their Bibles over and over again, which they don't, but they could, and they'll never see that talk. So how do you receive Christ? You believe the truth about Christ, and you believe the truth that applies to you as to how you become a Christian, and when you become a Christian, you believe the truth and live by it as to how a Christian lives. So notice when you have faith in you based on the Word of God that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, what you have been given is the power to become the Son of God. You're not made a Son of God, but the power to become a Son of God. No use talking about becoming a Son of God if you don't even believe in Him. So when you have the Word of God, when you have the testimony of the truth, when you have the light of the gospel, and it's led you, Romans 10, 17, to believe in Christ, you don't stop there. You continue in His Word, John 8, 31. And that's when you'll learn the rest of the plan of salvation and know in that plan of salvation just where you receive remission of sins. And Peter said it plainly. Baptism doth also now save us. 1 Peter three twenty one. So we must appropriate that power through obedient faith. And that's the way it works in the church. Concerning what God charges us to do and our obligations as Christians, we appropriate the blood of Christ as we continue to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the important point to keep in mind. So Jesus is the true light. He gives light to every man. He brings grace and truth to those in sin and error. He provides the way of salvation through His blood shed for the remission of our sins. Just think of what that means about the people that don't know him. They may have faith in him, but they've been taught you don't have to do what he said and the way he said it for the reason he said it, to have that faith saves you. They have a dead faith is what they have. And think about what that means to us that we ought to rejoice in, that we have understood the truth. It's not something that causes us to be proud, arrogant. It's something to be thankful for and realize the obligations we have to try to help other people. Sometimes, and this is where we fall short, even when we get an opportunity to talk to somebody, we don't know what to say to them, shake them up, make them think. Listen, you've got to make people think. And sometimes that's a very difficult thing to do. 
Thank you for studying this far, and we'll continue on with it, but that great and glorious light of the gospel is so important. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do it this afternoon. If it's a child of God, you need to repent of sins, confess them, and ask God for forgiveness. Now's the time to do that. And whatever you need in those areas, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.